the managing director, Graphic Communications Group, Mr. Atuafo, managing director, Stanbeck Bank, representative here, our distinguished guests and panelists, colleagues from the media, on behalf of the board, management and staff of Graphic, and our partner, Stanbeck Bank, I wish to welcome all of you to the second edition of the breakfast show today. Please kindly indulge me for a few minutes. My entire speech is on the, is in the graphic business today, and I will wish that each and, all, each and every one of you will pick up their phones, uh, either go to the Google Play Store or the Apple Store, kindly download the graphic news app, uh, and then subscribe to the graphic business. I'm sure you can get it. So what I'll do is just to paraphrase a bit of my speech here. So when the finance minister said last Sunday that the actual tax of getting out of the rules starts now, he was dead on. Again, when he said that we must brace ourselves for the challenges ahead, he was right. The key words the finance minister used were revenue mobilization, ECG collections, expenditure realignment, energy sector reforms, non arrears accumulation, and so on. And that is why we are here. And Winston did allude to that much earlier on. This is why this platform was created to provide solutions to our national challenges. In this particular instance, however, we want to look at the IMF and the impact on you personally. You and I, or I will say myself, the Joe Blues of this world. And time and again, we have to emphasize the fact that our brand is the most credible brand in the country. And we believe that this has been so because for graphic business and for graphic entirely, we have survived the economy for 70 years. I don't know how many of you here run companies or work for companies that have survived 70 years. So we have seen it all, 16 times of the IMF up and down. We've been there. We were there pre-colonial, and we are here. And so for us, we believe setting this agenda is a very key thing we have to do because we are part of the economy, and we must use our platform to, to always speak the truth and send the standard for the media industry. And again, when we do these things, it is not out of mischief, neither is it out of uh, the fact that we want to be very critical about everything. Of course, our mandate is also to be, to be critical about government and policies and everything, but of course, there's a larger mandate we have, which is to ensure that the business of this country goes on well. And we are part of the business as well, I did mention the last time. We also feel it. 90% of our imports, uh, of our production imports are imported. Our ink, our paper, everything. We pay taxes. Uh, we say we are state-owned. That is true, but we are self-financing. In fact, we pay dividends to governments. So we also feel the pinch of it. So when we set this platform, we want to find solutions to our national challenges. So that is what we want to do. And there's a popular saying that, after all, he who beats the path doesn't know how crooked the path is. So that's what we are trying to do with this project. We want to find solutions to our national challenges, and we believe we can do that. On behalf of the board, I want to thank you all for coming. Mine is a short one, uh, and to welcome you all to come, uh, for coming. I look forward to engaging most of you and finding solutions how we can use our platform for the good of this country. I thank you all for coming.
Thank you very much. Of course, very important that we look forward to finding solutions. And that's the reason we're here this morning, because uh, yes, we all know what we are going through, but um, what more can we expect and how can we cope and how can we ensure that we are able to thrive? And as he did indicate, this is a collaboration between Graphic Business and Stambeck Bank. So we'd invite the CEO of Stambeck Bank, Kwame Nassumini, to give us some brief remarks. Let's welcome him with a round of applause. Okay, so I think that uh, Mauko Afajini would do that. Uh, let's welcome Mauko as he comes to uh, give us some brief remarks on behalf of uh, Stambik Bank. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My friend, the MD graphic, I see a lot of my very big brothers and sisters in the room, all protocols observed. Talking about Ghana's economy in moments like this tends to be a very tricky one. Um, tricky in large part because I guess most of our compatriots and people in this country would say that we've seen better times. And the difficulty with this particular moment is not that we've seen better times, but that we had great expectations. Now, if you put the two together, it creates a bit of a dilemma. And we are left scratching our heads. A lot of people are wondering, what does this mean to us? If you've been fortunate like me to have gone through the various vicissitudes of the economy of this country, all the way back to when I was a little kid and we saw the yellow corn days. And, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room, the younger ones don't know the yellow corn days, but I'm not going to regale you with all those. And those were the days when we had to literally go and queue for Utin Shinu. And uh, you have to speak Gan to understand the one. But the point is that We've been through various cycles. We've seen lows, we've experienced highs. And we're going through one such difficult cycle again. What's pertinent, what's important is each particular cycle is unique. And that's the reason why it's important to have this conversation. Because ultimately, as surely as the day counts after the night, they are going to be losers and winners when we get out of the cycle. And our desire as a bank is for as many of us, the good people of this country, to be winners and to come out of the cycle better, deeper, and of course richer. And we believe we're going to have an hour of illuminating conversations. Insights about where we are, what it means, particularly how to cope, but also essentially how to make the best out of it, how to thrive. Because you see, I belong to an organization who has as its purpose the growth of this country. We say Africa is our home, we drive a growth. And that is predicated on the well-being, the prosperity, and the growth of every single person in Ghana, in this room. And so please, my senior brothers, my friends, my colleagues, let's just be ready for an hour plus of what we hope will be a riveting conversation so that we all come out of this feeling much better and in a much better place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco Afajini, who is Head of Marketing at Stambeck Bank. We'll would continue the program and invite the MD of Graphic Communications Group Limited, Atuafel, to give us his brief remarks. Let's welcome him with a round of applause.
our chairman for this occasion, the representative of the chief executive of Stambik Bank, our expert panelists, our distinguished participants, ladies, gentlemen, and our audience member networks across our digital and media partner channels. It is always a privilege to welcome and share a thought with you at our breakfast meeting made possible by the graphic business and enabled by Stambik Bank, Ghana. Our topic is very simple, it's very clear. I think the economist and other experts would speak to that. The editor, Mauko, have gone into that. But you look at the theme, this is the current economic situation and you, what to expect, cope, how to cope, how to thrive. Three key content words for me, uh, I'm a student of language, so I'll start from that perspective. And both three words, expect, cope, thrive, are verbs. One is an intransitive verb, those of you who did a bit of grammar. Yesterday I had the privilege of speaking to one of my uh, good grammar lecturers on a call. Simple terms, when we say we're expecting, we're looking at, we're regarding what is likely to happen. When we want to cope, we have to deal with and attempt to overcome problems and difficulties that we encounter. And to thrive, we have to grow vigorously, do well, flourish, to gain wealth or possessions, importantly, to prosper. In his book, Predicting the Future, Nicholas Risha writes that we, we incline to view the future through a telescope as it were, thereby magnifying and bringing nearer what we can manage to see, quote, closed. So do we, so too do we view the past and sometimes present through the other end of the telescope, making things look farther away than they actually were or losing sight of things altogether. In my mind, these observations apply neatly to our conversation. A couple of days ago, I, I, I put a thought on my digital channels from Anthony Chekhov, which says, knowledge is of no value unless you put it into practice. I do not doubt that we know, or we, we do not know what to do. We do. So for me, this conversation should be from the point of view where we need to change our behavior to work, how we manage our resources and our ways of doing, our values and also an attitudes that we have as a people. When we have done that, I believe we'll be in a better place to enable us progress into the future. I've been reading a certain book which I believe will inspire some of you or make some of you very jealous. It is written by the professor, the late professor Albert Edubwahin and it's titled Infants Film and the Making of Ghana, 1876 to 1976. On page 236 of that book, one of the founding fathers of Infantium School, Reverend R.A. Lockhart, made a note to a certain lead academic of another institution, A.G. Fraser, on the 6th of December, 1932. This is long, long ago. He makes this simple note, which I think is something that all of us should avail our minds to, the economists, the, or whoever, the experts, we need to consider quite seriously if we want to progress this conversation and leave this country happily. And he makes the quote saying, when a family cannot make ends meet, the head of house does not give cake to his favorite child if he has not sufficient bread for the others. I end the quote there. So for me, I think that there are a few things that I'd recommend to this august body and which I hope this discussion would hone in on. One of them is lifestyle changes that will reflect our current position. The second one is hard work, good work uh, culture, and then also an ethic of work. Three, transparency. 
Four, honesty. Five, responsibility and accountability. And then six, cultural changes and attitudes that reflect the times and what it is that we want to become. William Arthur Ward makes a note that the pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change. The realist would adjust the seals. Now, how do we progress this? And I'm sure the experts that we've assembled would go into some of these uh, notes that I have made. How do we open, this, open up this economy? In the midst of all these constraints, whatever, there's also opportunity. So there are things that we can do to open up this economy. I believe we can create opportunities in low-hanging industries that we are enabled with, like the agri-economy, tourism, that would offer us some quick wins, enabled by technology. And these will require initiative that will indirectly transfer the responsibility of creating opportunities from the state to the individuals with the requisite and deliberate state policies. I am of the view that whereas neoliberal privatization and private capital is imperative, not every aspect of our development, machinery, and economy can be in private hands. The public welfare has its place. Sustainable livelihood, like uh, communal space, water, seed for the farms, and workable agricultural land are all things that need a certain level of uh, state control. And while capital has been globalized, the regulation of production has not. So we can control that to our good. Thirdly, I believe that ideas are what influence culture, not technology on its own. So we need to promote the spread and integration of ideas, values, norms, behaviors, and ways of life. Out of this discussion, I'm hoping that we'll come forth with ideas that would enable us to change the way we do things and how we work. My other note is about identification and taxation that follows the wealth that evolves from the creation process. So we need to create and then also go into the process of taxation. We complain uh, timelessly that the very few people are the ones carrying the tax burden in this land. As we open up this economy with ideas, with other solutions, I believe that would enable us to identify the rest of the people who are out of the bracket to bring them forth into that ecosystem to enable us resource this economy meaningfully. Ultimately, I think we need to show the care and commitment to that which will build this economy for us. As a people, sometimes I wonder if we genuinely care about this land. Because if we cared, there are certain things that we may not necessarily be doing. So our Honorable Chairman, uh, distinguished uh, panelists, audience member networks, I believe that we will share some ideas that would enable our conversation into action steps. So for me, key words, we need to learn to behave differently. We need to commit to changes. We need to create the opportunities that would enable us go forward thereby we will grow and also continue to do. Because even when you grow and you don't continue that habit of doing, you will not be successful. So I thank you very much for joining us this morning and we look forward to all the ideas that will enable this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Atofu, who is MD of Graphic Communications Group. Of course, we all would need to learn and most importantly, we need to focus on how we can grow. Now, the chairman for today's occasion is the CEO of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Now, before taking up the position of CEO in 2014, he served as the head of research and advocacy at the chamber. He's also worked in the strategic planning, uh, research, risk management department of the National Investment Bank. He's an economist 
and a chartered accountant. He's also an expert in private sector development and international trade and finance. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mark Bedouabwaja, chairman for today's event. Thank you very much, Winston. Let me say good morning to all of us here and those who are either listening to us or watching us on other platforms. And all protocols duly observed. In this era where chairmanship has become very competitive, and I observe what happened recently with the political parties, if you don't have money, the likelihood that you lose is there. I deem it as a great honor and privilege to be given this opportunity to chair this important breakfast meeting. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have all gathered here to discuss a very important issue, that is the economy. It affects me, and I know it also affects you. As has been already alluded to by the previous speakers, the theme for this um, breakfast meeting, which is current economic situation and you. In fact, when I was called and I was sent the theme, it reminded me of the Shewa Sitium and the Shewa Brabum. Basically, that's what the theme is. But we'll focus on what to expect, how to cope, and how to thrive. For me, I think that it's very important we are discussing this, as each and every one of us is struggling to navigate through this difficult economic moment. Of course, the Ghanaian economy has gone through a very turbulent period since 2020. And after struggling domestically to turn the fortunes of the economy around without success, we all turned up to IMF for a bailout. IMF is in. We know it's going to bring macroeconomic stability, debt sustainability, and also lay the foundation for inclusive growth. However, it always also comes with conditionalities and consequences that may bring initial hardship to all of us. One may ask, what is the current economic situation that we are here to discuss. I know Prof and the other panelists will uh, shed more light on it, but permit me to share some data with you to set the discussion. Inflation at the end of May is 42.2%, and of course, it's among the highest in Africa, actually the third highest after Zimbabwe and Sudan. After inching up to 54.1%, we saw a decline until the recent one where some of the conditionalities and the IMF, i.e. the numerous taxes and the automatic adjustment of utility tariffs have pushed inflation to 42.2%. We have seen some stability in the foreign exchange market but of course, the rate of the CD to the dollar is still high, 12, hovering around 12 CDs to one um, dollar. And if you are importing, you understand what it means for the CD to depreciate. The policy rate is at its all-time high of 29.5%. Of course, the highest since we started this policy rate issue some years back. And once the policy rate goes up, you all know the impact on the lending rate. I know some big bank and other banks are here. But on average, you are likely to get a loan or a facility at a rate of 35 to 40%. That is if your risk profile is good. Otherwise, you hit the 45s. And sometimes you wonder how business survives under such interest rates. Excessive taxation, 
businesses are overburdened with taxes, consumers. We can talk about taxation without talking about the three taxes that were introduced quite recently as part of the IMF conditionalities. The growth and sustainability levy, the excise duty, and the income tax. Of course, the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry and other business associations have made our concerns clear that these taxes are counterproductive. And the reason why we are seeing inflation going up and the likelihood that inflation for the next month to go up is also there. I think Prof will address that. Rapid increase in utility tariffs. You've seen the increase in water tariffs and electricity. Decreasing gross international reserve. High debt to GDP levels. Reduction in purchasing power as consumers, our ability to buy goods and services has gone down because of inflation. The effect is that it has also caused a reduction in revenue of businesses. So you are caught between reduction or declining revenue and increasing cost of production. Your profit is either negative or you are breaking even. Or for the sake of survival, you are making a loss, but you are keeping hope alive. The list goes on. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the above macroeconomic indicators are having far-reaching negative effects on all sectors and all economic actors. Businesses are suffering. Citizens are suffering. Politicians are suffering just because this economic situation definitely will be the basis for campaign in by-elections and the 2024 election. The government in power is explaining, finding solutions to these difficulties. The opposition is capitalizing and using it as a capital tool. So they are also suffering. Indeed, everyone is suffering. We have gathered here with a common purpose to gain insight, exchange ideas, and equip ourselves with the necessary tools to navigate this difficult economic climate. By collectively examining the current happenings and understanding the implication we can forge a path forward that ensures resilience, growth, and success. We all agree that Russia-Ukraine war has had effect on our economy. We all agree that COVID has had effect on our economy. What we don't seem to agree is the role that we have played in bringing ourselves to this level. Let us accept our part of this difficulty so we can begin to think and deal with it. We are truly honored this morning to have such blend of intellect and experience from both academia and industries as panelists to help us address this topical issue. I know Prof. Bob Kane is here. If there's somebody who has been synonymous, his name and voice has been synonymous with IMF and related issues. I think it's Prof. I was with him on the PM Express yesterday. We have Dr. Benjamin Boachi and Mr. Timothy Mugodi. Once again, I extend my warmest welcome to those of us here and anyone listening or watching us through any other platform. Your presence here today reinforces our commitment to fostering collaboration and finding innovative situations, solutions to our current economic woes and putting our economy on the right trajectory. May this gathering inspire us all to be able to cope, and that is what we need, and after coping, we must thrive, otherwise we will die as businesses, so that all of us will turn our economy around. Thank you for being part of this remarkable event, and I wish all of us a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mark Bedua Boaji. Indeed, businesses are suffering. But uh, Mark, businesses would not die. 
that one we are all sure that businesses would not die. And I like the fact that Mark takes uh, you know, the opportunity to address all the concerns that he has as businesses. Like our people say, if you want to say something to God, you say it to the wind. So uh, Mark is taking advantage and communicating to government all the things that he expects government to do. For once, I thought I was listening to somebody who is in the high levels of government today when you started the suffering bit. I said that you ended after the third one. Maybe if you had continued, you had talked about teachers suffering, nurses suffering, market women suffering, students are suffering, everybody suffering, would have all hailed you and said, let's go away. Anyway, let's continue with the conversation. Thank you once again, Mark Bidwabaji, who is the chairman for the event. And so we're not going to be introducing the panelists for today's conversation. And Mark started by talking about economist and professor of finance, Gottfried Bockbing. He's our first panelist. Let's welcome him. Now, if you talk about Ghana's IMF program, of course, you're right, Mark. He's one person who's been talking about it. He's the one who said, if we don't go early, we'll go in an ambulance. Well, it looks like we actually went in an ambulance uh, because by the 1st of July, we we're so much in a hurry to get on, under an IMF program. He'll be addressing what to expect, but also joining the conversation this morning on how to cope is energy governance professional and the executive director at the Africa Center for Energy Policy with extensive experience in managing research and programs related to the extractive sector governance in Africa, Benjamin Boache. Let's welcome him. And last but not least is the head of corporate investment and banking of Stambik Bank Ghana Limited, Tim Mugodi. Let's welcome him. Great, so we're gonna do a few things. Um, for today's discussion, I'll just ask very few questions. It's all about you. I won't take much of the time. Once we're done with asking a question or two, we'll give you a chance to ask questions. And so for all of you who uh, complained in previous discussions that you didn't have enough time to ask questions, we have listened and we're gonna be doing that. So let's start the conversation. We'll start a conversation, let me just take my seat and then we'll start the conversation with Professor Godfrey Bobkin shortly on what to expect when it comes to the current economic situation and you. So let me start with you, Professor Bobkin. So we know we've gone to the IMF. Um, it's one of the things that we all said was going to help, help us as a people and help us, you know, put our economy back on track. In the past, we didn't know much about, um, you know, the conditionality. Now we know. But of course, the question is, now that all these conditionalities have been put before us, what can we expect going forward? Both positive and negative. All right, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, um, uh, Chairman. Good morning, everyone, my co-panelists. Um, I accepted this invitation because I believe that Ghana can make it. I believe that together we can come out of this. I believe I accepted the invitation because we need to be clear that there's a price we have to pay to come out of this. And oftentimes we are uncomfortable when we talk about the price we have to pay for the kind of uh, sustainable development that we want, but we must be willing to pay that price. And that price that we have to pay oftentimes may not be shared equally. Sometimes you see that the adverse distributional effects may disproportionately affect other groups compared to as, actually where you, you wish that uh, the higher price will be paid by those who probably brought it upon ourselves. But that's not what is in the program. But I'll, I'll get to that, okay? Um, so I, I supported Ghana going to the IMF, and, and I do not regret it. I still support that, uh, and this will not be the last one. Um, are, you suggesting, are you suggesting we mismanage our economy? Um, this program, the 17th program that was approved on the 17th of May, right? You keep that in mind. The 17th program mm -hmm. was approved on the 17th of May. Sure. This program is designed with extension in mind. Okay. So if you look at the program objectives and the adjustments in the program, and when we are supposed to res restore debt sustainability, 
And if you look at the way we've managed our affairs, especially in an election year, you almost predict with certainty that there will be an extension. So in effect, we will not be done by 2026? No, we will not. Okay. And then the reason I'm saying so also is that the kind of expenditure cuts that we were asking and hoping for under the IMF supported program is not what is in this program. Okay. If you look at the expenditure cut in this program, you will see that we are cutting down on CAPEX, but Ghana has huge infrastructure deficits. So if you want to scale up, if you want to develop, you need to spend more in the area of capital. Okay, and because other than that, you are running down your infrastructure, you may not be able to maintain it, and you can't add to your infrastructure stock. What that would do in the medium to the long term is that it will impose further restrictions on the growth drivers of the economy. Now, if you look at how many hours, minutes, it took us to get here, right? And if you look at how many hours it takes the average Ghanaian to get to work, and the productive hours we spend in traffic, and the it effect on productivity, you have to be unique to think that this country can make it if we don't do something fundamental about this. Economic activity, on the average, is movement. So anything that restricts movement, movement of labor, capital, goods, and the rest of them, is, you are imposing restrictions on the growth drivers of the economy. Now we are cutting on CAPEX, and government is hoping to save 0.9% of GDP from CAPEX reduction. Then sure. we, are limiting, we are limiting wages and limiting hiring, and we expect to make some savings from there. And then also when it comes to statutory transfers, we are going to cap it and all that. So all of this, these are the expenditure card government negotiated for all of us. And government is hoping to make fiscal savings of about 3% of GDP. And then revenue enhancement. Revenue enhancement is supposed to bring 3% of GDP. Then the expenditure cut about 2%. So the fiscal adjustment under this program to restore debt sustainability is just about 5% of GDP. Okay. Now, if your debt stock in present value terms is as high as that of Ghana, and you want to restore debt sustainability within the next five years, your primary surplus should not be less than 10%. Mm. But fiscal adjustment is going to do just about 5%, right? So that tells you that the bulk of the adjustment is actually going to come from debt restructuring. Okay. Now, and then when you look at the debt restructuring mm -hmm. and the domestic one that we have done, we are not done. In fact, Ghana has restructured less than 50% of its domestic debt. Let's okay. explore that a little bit, yes, because I have seen that in the IMF document. When you say we are not done, what else is left for us to do? So, we, as at the end of 2022, our total domestic debt, that is a uni universe of eligible domestic debt to be restructured, is around 259 billion cities. Okay. So far, we've only restructured 85% of 98 billion cities. So as we speak, we have more than 123 billion cities of domestic debt yet to be restructured, mm. which includes the cocoa bill, which includes pensions, which includes Bank of Ghana's overdraft extension to the government. That's about 77.6 billion cities. That's not the end. Then you can see how the treasury bill is also rising. Of course, that is not up for discussion because that's the only avenue government has kept to interact with the financial markets. That is just the domestic debt. Then when it comes to external debt, and you look at the program financing, the financing gap in balance of payment terms is estimated to be around $15 billion. Okay. So the IMF program that has IMF name on it, the IMF is only providing just about $3 billion. That's far less. We expect the bulk of the financing gap, right, to come from external debt restructuring. And we are Ghana is looking forward to a more than $10 billion in debt relief or fresh funding from our external bilateral and external commercial. Is that not too much to ask from somebody else? In a global setting where COVID did not only specialize in Ghana, where Russia, Ukraine imparted every country. So that tells you that there's risk ahead. And it is not a given that the external bilateral and external commercial suddenly will show up and say that, look, we owe you uh, 29 billion. We are writing off 
more than 45% of that. Okay. And we can learn from other countries like Chad. In the case of Chad and their debt restructuring, it actually didn't result in debt relief immediately. Okay. So in addition to the program conditionalities, these bilateral partners may impose other conditionalities before they will give us some kind of relief. That tells you where we should go. Now, since we've talked about that, we need to look at the way out. Exactly. It is not the case that Ghana hasn't developed because we have not collected enough tax revenue. We know that our tax to GDP ratio is very low. But if you do the modeling, you will see that with our level of tax to GDP, this is not where Ghana should be. In fact, if you compare Ghana's case to Malaysia, okay, at independence, at GDP per capita, in fact, we were far better off living in Ghana during independence in the early 60s actually than being in Malaysia or actually than being in Singapore. Sure. Ghana's GDP per capita in 1961-62 was actually higher than South Korea. If you look at the graph today, you see where Malaysia is, where Singapore is, and where Ghana is. The gap seems almost impossible to close. But Malaysia and Singapore did not develop on the back of more revenue. In the last 15 years, if you look at the tax to GDP of Malaysia, and you look at tax to GDP ratio of Singapore, it's not exceptionally higher than that of Ghana. How did they transform their country? They did so through efficiency, lean government, right? And they dealt with corruption. Ghana loses more than $3 billion annually through corruption. That's a conservative estimate. That is more than what the IMF could give us. Great. So, Prof, having set the tone, I'm sure for all those who are listening to us on Joy FM and watching us on the Joy News channel, they ask, so what would happen to me going forward? What am I to expect in terms of my finances, in terms of my livelihood, and in terms of my well-being? Okay, great. So the, pro the main objective of the program is to restore macroeconomic stability. That is going to come at a price, right? What will be the price? The price will be the adjustments that we have to go through. If you look at the plan adjustment, utility adjustment under the program, that is going to affect households, that's going to affect businesses directly. Then again, if you look at the level of taxes, right, and there is clear indication that if we are unable to meet the revenue targets as program, government may adopt other measures to, to, to increase that. Because under the program, we are hoping to increase our revenue to GDP to about 18.2%. Sure. To even increase your revenue by one percentage point of GDP is going to impose a lot of burden. And we are hoping to scale up from less than 13% to about 18.2%. Now, you look at the tax rates. If you pick Ghana's effective VAT rate, it's more than 21%. And in fact, it's the highest in Africa. When I say in highest in Africa, we are not benchmarking ourselves against Zimbabwe and the others. Let's look for better peers, right? And, and, and we should be concerned because if you look, whatever we are doing here, let's not conceptualize it as though Ghana is an island. We are operating within a certain global economy and within a continental that is looking forward to more integration under the African continental free trade. Okay. okay. So whatever we are doing, we should be looking at it in relative terms to what is happening in other African countries that perhaps we are competing with, like maybe Cote d'Ivoire, because they are so close to us, right? Like, like Kenya, of course, Kenya is also going through a similar challenges like we are going through. We should be, look, we should be looking at it. So if you look at Ghana's VAT, it's the one of the highest in, 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 in Africa, mm. even though and all that we have done. And, and I get concerned. We have adopted a certain backdoor approach to burdening the system when we tell a different story. So you see the corporate tax rate reduced to 25%, and you are likely to conclude that Ghana has one of the lower, lowest corporate tax rate, right? But then we use the back door through growth and sustainability levy, and all kind of then. So at the end of the day, when you put all the taxes together, the effective incidence of that tax is very high. In the okay. banking sector, it's more than 35%. Now, if you pick an individual, who has crossed the poverty line, even if he didn't see the line. And, and, and that individual probably is in the higher income tax bracket. You are going to pay a tax, personal income tax of about 35%. And then if you decide to buy maybe your consumption from maybe VAT uh, shops or whatever, the cumulative VAT 
it's more than 21%. If you add that to the 35% you've paid already, and then if you buy fuel, more than 40% of that is taxes. If you take that individual and you look at his total effective tax in a year, it's more than 60%. Wow. Now, if you look at the data from Ghana Statistical Center, I said, let our policy prescription be driven by data. If you pick the data from Ghana Statistical Service, and that is what you see on the board here, right? No, you go back. The data suggests that household expenditure survey, Ghanaians spend almost 44% of household expenditure on food. On food. And then if you look at the percentages and you are done, it leaves very little fiscal space for the average Ghanaian to save. Now, any country that is not saving, you cannot finance your own growth. And you will depend on foreign capital. And that is what this country is going through. And, and the evidence of that is what you see in our balance of payment data. You will see that from 2017, Ghana has been recording trade surplus. In other words, we earn more from exports than we actually needed to meet our import worth needs. That surplus, holding other factors constant, theoretically, should contribute to the strengthening of your local currency. Sure. So even though we've seen that trade surplus, we've also seen the city depreciating consistently. The reason you see it in the other component of the balance of payment data that we call services and income account, which is a reflection of the excessive for foreign dominance in the economy, right? Which shows up in the first quarter of the year, profit transfer, dividend transfer, coupon payment on government bonds and the rest of them. So there's very little local content in this economy. In fact, if you pick the most lucrative industries, the industries that are far offer above risk adjusted average returns, Ghanaians are visibly missing. Okay, look, there is no country that can develop without being intentional in growing it indigenous private sector. Okay. That is the only way you can retain growth. Other than that, what we have been doing is to pound enough fufu for others to go and eat. You should not conclude merely by visiting a community and seeing that they are preparing food, they are pounding fufu, and then you conclude that these people are enjoying. Wait. You look at where the fufu will be sent after it's been pounded, where it will be sent, where it will be consumed. That is where joy will happen. So let's look at it this way. You've talked about you know, the fact that, yes, um, we're looking at automatic adjustment in utility prices. Um, we have a challenge with, for instance, wages. I mean, government has agreed to you know, uh, review wages so we can make savings. We're also looking at increasing revenue generation. In fact, the fund says that our program is hinged on increased revenue generation, an indication that if it's not working, we have to think about getting more. We have to go through another exchange. We're talking about even the dollar-denominated local bonds. We'd have to touch that also. Pension funds, all things being equal, would have to be touched because we have not met it. Now, if you look at all of these things, coupled with what we were told in the past, that if we go to, an IM, uh, if we go to the IMF, all things would turn well for us, and so we should wait. Already people are complaining that they haven't seen the magic one in turning the exchange rate depreciation around. Going forward for that man listening, for that business listening, how long can he expect things to turn around for the good? All right, thank you. I want to start off by looking at the statement the president made during his last fellow Ghanaian speech that the IMF program is not the immediate solution to all our problems, and I agree. That reflects reality. The question is, what do we need to do to complement the program? This is how the IMF works. And if any of us is thinking that the IMF suddenly will come and transform our economy, IMF doesn't do that. In fact, IMF doesn't have a single case study of a country that they have transformed economically. Right, you can check. You can check. In the time past, Ghana used to be a shining example of IMF interventions, but this is where we are. To come out of this, I will look at it this way. When the IMF says that these are the broad fiscal policy frameworks that you need to have, it's then up to the government to decide on the specific interventions, strategies to achieve that. 
we said this way back in 2021, that we need to preempt what was coming. Assuming the, gov the president decides that I'm going to go the way of Cote d'Ivoire, I'm reducing the size of my government to, let's say, 31. We can cost the savings. We can cost the savings. That's why I'm saying that there's a way to do a fiscal adjustment okay. that preserves the cash flow of households and businesses. And we chose not to do that one. In fact, we could reach almost the same point in fiscal adjustment if we decided that we're going to adopt a lean government and, and just close, merge about five to six ministries and see the savings you will make. And then look at agencies, departments, authorities that we have created. If you pick transportation alone and you look at the, that value chain and you look at the number of ministries in that value chain, I don't think we need all of them. The point is that you are in a crisis and you want to come out, you are looking at the kind of expenditure cut that will not hurt growth. We are looking at the expenditure cut that you need to do that will promote growth. Okay. And first and foremost, the state does not exist for aid comfort. The state must use all aid powers and, and, and to facilitate the growth of businesses because that is where job creation is going to come from. You can even look at tax from two perspectives. Tax as an investment. So there are countries that lower their taxes as a way of promoting what? Businesses. So okay. that when businesses grow, look, assuming we had like, if you go and check top 20 businesses in Africa, top 50 businesses in Africa, you will not find Ghana in there. If we are looking for top 20 rich Africans, Ghana is missing. If, if, if you pick, so, so the point that I'm making is that the, the method we have chosen to mm. restore debt sustainability is going to impose unnecessary hardship. Okay. And, and, and we can avoid that. Thank you very much, Prof. But before I get to Ben Boache, you, you make a point in the transportation sector. So we have Ministry of Roads and Highways, Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Railway Development. Uh, you, you want us to merge all of these into one? Speak into the microphone. Why can't we do that? Okay. If any president comes and says that he can't do that, he should resign. Okay? We are not looking for perfect people to govern this country because we can't get that here. Right? If the president cannot govern this country with less than 40 ministers, he should step down. Including the current president? He should step down. What is, what is wrong with that? Okay. You, you, we said that govern with this number of people because we don't have the budget to sustain all of that, okay? Collapse that, sell the V8, I hope you understand that. Mm. You know what, you need to declare war on this economy, <laughs> right? And marshal all the experts. It doesn't matter which party you, do you know something? Let's not joke about it. Okay. In 2040, Ghana's population will reach 45 million, 2040. 58% of that population will be less than 30 years. As we speak, 1.6 million Ghanaians who are in the economically active age group, they are successfully unemployed. <laughs> Out of that percentage, more than 300,000 of that are food insecure and multidimensionally poor. Mm. These are people created in the image and likeness of God. Professor and this trend is expected. You, no, let me tell you something. You should get worried. Briefly, before I get to Benjamin because Bache. all of us sitting here, no one is safe. Mm. If you look at Ghana's prime areas, we are surrounded by slums. Okay? For a good number of Ghanaians you meet on the street, their prayer content is not peace. You need peace to enjoy your wealth. You drive in and you drive out. Increasingly, a large number of Ghanaians, they are not sure where their next meal will come from. This is breakfast meeting. We'll take breakfast. Somebody is not sure where his breakfast will come from. Thank you a very much. A good number of Ghanaians go to bed. Look, there are so many things you can delay. You can delay childbirth. You can postpone your marriage. You can disengage even after engagement. How long can you postpone hunger? This is the portion of increasingly a large number of Ghanaians. You know How what? should we put this before we understand? Mm. Professor Bokping, I see that uh, uh, the participants are loving everything you're saying. And those who are listening and watching us would also love it. But my job is to ensure that we continue on how we can cope 
and how we can thrive. So I'll get back to you, and I want a lot of you to ask the questions. I don't want to talk that much. So let me get to you, uh, Ben Bache. Uh, Prof. Bokwing has set the tone. He's told us that, look, the hardships are facing us. In fact, people today cannot find food to eat. There are people who are concerned. There are people who are concerned about, um, you know, how they're going to keep their lights on and not turn off some of the gadgets because they just can't afford, you know, paying the bills all the time. There are people who are concerned about, you know, how to uh, move their vehicles out of their homes. Even if they decide not to move their vehicles, they're also concerned about, uh, you know, how much it would cost them by way of transportation and the delays even in getting to where they are going and how much that would cost them also. The key question here is, how do I cope? Yes, we know the challenges, but the most important thing is how I can cope before I think of thriving. How do we cope? Um, thank you very much, Winston, and um, good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a privilege to be uh, on this panel. In fact, when I saw the topic, how uh, do you cope? I asked myself, I mean, I'm struggling to cope. And suddenly I'm the one to um, show people the way um, how to cope. But I mean, as a patriot, as a Ghanaian, I think we are in uh, uncharted territories where a lot of sacrifices are required of all of us um, to appreciate that we can't afford to let our country fail. And therefore, uh, we have to take the hard decisions for ourselves and for country uh, to ensure that we pull off uh, uh, even through these challenges. Um, the reality is that, I don't know if the mic Yes, it's working. Right, okay. The reality is that, you know, we have to change our lifestyles. Uh, we have to adjust. And most importantly, we have to psychologically program ourselves for a period of difficult uh, situations uh, to come. Um, inflation above 40% is not going to go away overnight. So it tells you that if it stays for another year, you should expect to pay about 40% more uh, than you're paying today for the things that you, you so cherish and desire. Um, where that money will come from it's your own economics. Yeah, but um, uh, Ben, some of us. You see, the point you're making, let me just cut in at this point, the point you're making. Now, inflation is high. As you sit here, you cannot even walk to your employer and say, please increase my salary, because he's also struggling. So, if inflation is high and all the things are going up, how do you cope? Yeah, so first of all, I was coming to that point. Um, you have to program yourself that things are, first of all, going to be tough, and therefore, some necessary cuts are important. Um, if you used to, and I mean, there's this joke around that people are now going to have to start to have a, a one good meal a day and adjust to more water, which you cannot really avoid. Um, I mean, we know that per the IMF program, if you read the program carefully, inflation is actually programmed into the program. Uh, it's going to happen because IMF says that we need to have a cost-reflected tariff. What that means is only government and IMF that knows, right? So what it means is that they're going to be adjusting the tariff until they meet that cost-reflective tariff. And once they keep adjusting electricity and water, everything is impacted by that adjustment. So we have to prepare for that. It will come uh, before we can meet the benchmarks to be able to move to another level. So that is an adjustment that we have to do um, lifestyle changes have to happen. But for me, whilst we do all of that to be able to survive and continue to contribute to the economic development of our country, the important point that Prof talks about, you know, getting the government to meet us halfway and do the heavy lifting, is not negotiable. <laughs> we really need to ensure that that happens. And Every time I keep saying that where we are today is not just the doing of the government, it's the doing of all of us. Because when it was happening, we saw it happen. And we saw the poor decisions being taken. And we knew that those decisions was going to land us somewhere. We were writing about it. We were saying them. Maybe we could have been extra tough on our demands to ensure that governance was working for the people. 
We were all watching, only to realize that if you are a banker, you are uh, an industrialist, you are a producer of any commodity, it's not enough to say that I'm minding my business. Because when the haircuts are coming, they are not selective. You will get it. Whether you worked and put your pension in government investment or not, that haircut will hit you. And therefore, ensuring that governance works for the people and works for businesses is a job for all of us to do. And we've got into that space where we need to now appreciate that for us to be sustainable and ensure that we don't repeat this, and I hope it doesn't happen as Prof is predicting, that the 18th is on the way. We have to now ask questions and insist that the governance work. What do we do with the borrowing? All right? We talked about government programs, one village, one dam. And I recently read a report that says that none of the dams that we have spent over 250 million Ghana cities on is actually delivering the value that we, we actually anticipated. So we were hoping that if you were producing one bag by doing off-season agriculture, you produce two. And we have invested money and generated zero value. We watched it happen. We watched people develop those dams and take, took money for them, and nothing has resulted from it. The biggest crime of our country is our procurement system, where consistently it has been reviewed and we know that corruption is so massive in our procurement system, and we have tracked it. It will be difficult for you to find any government contract above $1 million go through competitive tender in this country. It is so sourced. And not just because you go on the shelf and you can see $1 million, and government also went for it for $1 million, which you wouldn't have a problem with. You will see $1 million thing on the shelf and the government will go for it for $10 million, and it will still be so sourced. Go through the numbers. We all have to be interested. The chairs that government procure, how much do they buy them? We all go to the market. The basic things that government procure, 10, five times more than what you can buy on the shelf. But we watch them happen, and then they crystallize into debt, and they have the power of the state to pass laws to tax you more, and we are watching. So we can no longer be that kind of citizens hoping to adjust in difficult times, but we need to get the government to do the heavy lifting. Okay. As we speak today, i make my last point on this. We keep talking about downsizing. I know it may be difficult for you to now start getting rid of junior staff, first degree holders who have been packed into the institutions and not generating value, right? It may be difficult. But there are people in these institutions of government who were doing fine. They were working. They have their own businesses. And yet they have <laughs> loaded them onto state institutions and they are sitting there arms folded and still taking money in the name of deputy CEOs, senior managers, and they are not producing any value. Some of the agencies have more than quadrupled in numbers, and their outputs have actually declined. What kind of economics are we doing here? These are the realities we have to demand of government to do the heavy lifting so that our pain <laughs> will be short-lived because we have to bear the brunt. We have to live it. We have to absorb the shocks from the taxes that are coming in. But for how long can we endure if the government is still going to be inefficient and continue to live large and not even worry about the inefficiencies? And the energy sector, I mean, if you read the IMF document, is one of the areas of focus for the program and the cocoa sector. I mean, we, we, we only buy cocoa. This is a country. We only buy cocoa, raw cocoa, and go and sell and bring money. And that we are doing at a loss. It's not government that produces the gold. All that government does is to buy the cocoa that has been produced, risk taken by the farmer. And all that the government, the intellectuals of our society, do is to go and sell the cocoa, tell us they got $1, and we are at the share of the farmer is 50 cents. That is all government is supposed to do. And they are doing that at a loss. And we are happy to continue smiling over that. And it takes IMF to come and tell us how we treat that kind of scenario. All of us have to get into that space. Businesses have to speak up because we have experienced that the next, I mean, every IMF program is 
perhaps harsher than they are, the, the previous. So mm. we don't know what the next one will look like. That's why I dread what Prof is predicting, that we could have another uh, IMF uh, uh, program. The waste in the energy sector. If government listened right from the beginning, we will still not be talking about energy sector problems because we have known the solution from 2014. We had a program to fix the problems, all right? And we are, we are not addressing the problem. We are delivering speeches on the, program, on the problem. And okay. even as we speak today, we are generating in 2023, we are generating power using HFOs because politicians want it. We are undermining gas supply because procuring HFO gives money to some people. And it's easier to do it. Right? So whilst IMF is saying that they should adjust your tariff, people are using the most expensive fuel to generate the power. And you have to bear the brunt ultimately for it. So that accountability cannot be delayed okay. Okay. Uh, in this harsh economic time whilst we agree that we all have to make the adjustments that are necessary. Thank you very much, uh, Ben Brache. So how about learning how to thrive now? So we've understood all the challenges. Uh, we've learned the coping mechanisms. Very difficult, the adjustments. Because even as you try, you know that times are really very, very hard. Tim, how do we thrive under these challenging circumstances? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my esteemed colleagues have uh, done a very good job of outlining uh, some of the challenges that we are facing and also outlining how we got to where we are. Um, so it is my, my duty to now talk about what we can do, what is in our hands as individuals and as corporations in the economy. Um, there's a lot of things that we, we have heard that need to be done by those in authority and those in power, uh, and, and, and we agree with all those things that have been mentioned. But I'm just going to focus for a minute on the things that are actually in our hands as individuals. What can you and I do in our own households? And the first thing I'd like to point out is adjusting our financial plans. We all have to look at our monthly expenditure, our annual expenditure, and see where we can cut. And I know this is very painful, uh, but at some point, when inflation is running at 40%, it means that unless you're getting 40% more cash, you are actually going to, to need to reduce somewhere along the line. And so the first thing that we must do is to try and reduce our expenditure. We could, for instance, reduce our reliance on imported goods and favor locally produced goods instead. Now that helps not only ourselves in terms of saving money in our pockets, it also helps the economy by reducing the burden on, on imports. And that would, would take off the pressure from the, from the CD to some extent. So that's the first thing we can all do. The second thing we can do which is related to that our, our debt. Um, now you've heard the interest rates that are, being, uh, that are being spoken about. These are the rates that are prevailing in the market all the way from the policy rate and that cascades through the whole economy. What it means is that, especially for businesses, um, if you're running a business uh, and you're producing uh, whatever products or services, uh, your ability to continue to make a profit starts to be diminished by the interest burden that you, you have to pay. And so one of the things that you can do is to seek ways of reducing your debt burden, reduce your debt levels, put a little bit more equity into the business and reduce what you borrow so that you can find your way through the, 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 the economic uh, problems, that you can cope. And hopefully that we can even thrive. Now, if I link those two things together, uh, you know, if all of us in our households start to reduce our dependence on imported goods, it then creates an opportunity for industry and commerce. Because as we've said, as we've heard, in every challenge also lies an opportunity. So by reducing our reliance on imported goods, it means that there's now more demand for locally produced goods. And in that, local industrialists can find opportunity to start producing more of those particular goods in the country. And so over time, one expects that we will then see a lot more local production of certain goods, which helps the economy overall. I think uh, Prof said quite eloquently earlier on that you, you cannot develop an economy without developing local industry. 
And so the way that we develop local industry is by consuming our own goods that we produce ourselves. Um, and so there's opportunities there for the household as well as for business as well. Now, related to this is, and, and one would hope that we have been doing this already before the economic hardships have hit us. And that is the issue of building reserves. Right? Whether you are an individual in your household or whether you are a corporate entity, you always need to build some reserves over time. So in, if I look at it from the household perspective, it then translates into savings. And again, savings are one of the critical things that at a national level would help to develop the economy. So we all need to create some reserves and make sure that for whatever we earn, we allocate a percentage of that earnings into savings. So that when you go through a troubled patch like what we're going through at the moment, you are able to cope. And if you cope through the problems afterwards, you can thrive. So savings and the accumulation of reserves is, is the, the third point that I wanted us to, to be encouraged upon. And then, lastly, I think that a lot of us, um, through the education system, don't necessarily get the correct level of financial literacy. Um, so I think that it's important for each individual to just upskill ourselves. We are so fortunate these days that you can just literally listen to Prof. Bokin and you end up almost uh, getting the same benefit that somebody who's studying economics at the university is getting, right? Because he's addressing these issues and it's in the public domain. Um, and you can, you can get podcasts, you can get things online that you can use to accumulate a little bit more knowledge. And, and that will help you to be able to make the correct decisions and to be able to guide your personal life as well as your business life. Um, you can also use that to then try to see how you can enhance your sources of income, either by you know, uh, doing uh, extra work on the side or producing additional products if you are, if you are a business. And then lastly, um, even though we do upscale ourselves, we can never become experts in the field. So it is also important for us to seek advice. Seek advice from the experts. If you are a business, seek advice from the financial planners and the, and the economists. In our own personal lives, you can have advice from personal bankers in the banks, you can have economists, you can have uh, other uh, sort of financial managers and financial planners who can help you to you know, put together your own personal affairs in a way that is, that is to, your, to, your, to your benefit. So Mr. Chair, I think I'll pause here, having mentioned four or five points that we can each individually do, which are in our hands, as opposed to things that we, we need to rely on other people to do for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tim Mugodi, who is Head of Investment and Corporate Banking at Stan Big Bank. So we've learned about what to expect, how to cope, and how to thrive. It's time for you now, the participants here, to ask all the questions that you have. So just show by hand. We'll get a microphone to you. Uh, you tell us your name and where you're coming from us in the institution you're representing. Go ahead and ask your question. My team here will write it down and address those questions. Yes, so let's see by hand those who have questions to ask. Okay, I see one hand here. Yes, um, go ahead, tell us your name and the institution you're representing. Then you can ask your question. Thank you very much. My name is Eric Nsambuatin. I am with KF. Yes, um, I would want to find out from um, the professor. You have mentioned that when you put all the taxes together, you are looking about you are looking at a figure around sixty percent. Okay, but I I disagree with you. The reason being that when you look at VAT, it is paid by the final consumer. Those firms only act as um, agents, okay? And then when you look at the growth and um, um, sustainability levy, it is based on your net profit before tax. And so what it means is that in business and your audited accounts is showing that your net profit before tax is zero. It means that you are not going to pay. And you see, for the, um, the corporate tax, you can make a loss. But when I do my tax, the, um, the computations, 
it could end up, or you, the company, having uh, a chargeable income. You could even make profit before tax. But when we do the tax, um, the computations, grant you um, the capital allowances, and even in a case whereby there has been a loss in the, uh, the previous year, which the law allows you to carry the loss forward. So I think that we need to look at that one. Now, you've also mentioned that we have a 10 billion, um, the, the, the gap that we have the, um, the lenders okay, to grant to us. Okay? And what I'm saying is that if you called for them to grant us that, is it a free or whatever? So, in that case, what happens? The other issue which I agree with you is that we are looking at a situation where the individual or the employee is paying more than the corporate you know, taxes. Because in the past, you agree with me that the last bracket in the individual tax has always been equal to the corporate tax, right? But now we have a situation where before this new law came into effect, the corporate tax rate, the highest was 30. Meanwhile, the corporate tax rate is 25. Now we've had to introduce this new law. It's now moved up to, um, yes, 35%. So what it means is that we, the individuals, are even suffering more than the companies. Okay, that is that. And then, my friend, uh, the one on the right, you, you made a very good point that we should be able to cut down on our expenditure beginning from the, uh, the household level. In my case, my salary for the past five years has remained the same. Okay? My kids' school fees have shot up. Electricity has shot up. So, and I work from 8 to 5 p.m. If I don't leave the office early, I have to drive for about two hours. And I'm sure those of you who live around Kaswa or Darwin, probably you'll be driving for three hours. So my thing is that, where will you even find the time now, additional work that you are saying? You're also saying that we can seek advice. Those who are going to give me the advice, they will charge you. So I, 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 I really don't understand it. You know, the last time that we met here, I think Prof was here, we said that Ghana, we must cut our according to our size. And we had, there was a gentleman who works with the uh, IMF, if you remember, he was here. He gave us all the statistics and all of that. The issue is, look, we know what to do. Just two weeks, two weeks ago, I I was in Copenhagen. I had attended um, a conference there. And I learned that the tax rate is very, very high. But the people are willing to pay. Because look, the road network, everything is perfect. It takes only 20 minutes by train to move from Copenhagen to Sweden, the, the nearest town. And you, you go to the train station, you pay only 100. Then it's Krona. And 20 minutes, you are in Sweden. I did some shopping. Water. No, my, my last bit. I, I bought, I bought my, some water and other things. Now, I went to the hotel room. And then I, f I found that uh, there was this bill there. But I hadn't gotten the Yes. So I went back. Oh, and the man said, oh, when you bring back drank the water. When you bring back the empty bottles, we are going to pay you X amount. And all these are uh, people, they go, they see the drainage system. Odor River, similar one in um, right ac across where I was staying. The boats are there. People pay 100 krona and you get a ride on the boat. So I don't, I don't know. We've been meeting here every year. They, we, we are tired. So if you say we should wage a war, I don't know what, what kind of war. Because look, I am really suffering. I am really suffering. Thank you. Okay, so I see.
I see um, two other hands there. I, I promise that this time around, I'll, I'll let all of you ask questions. Uh, let's get the two questions, and then we'll get to the panelists to address uh, you know, the questions. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, oh okay. Thank you. My name is uh, Adodo Alfredo Kantamaklo. I'm the CEO of Burswell Group Limited uh, in Osu, uh, this thing, uh, Ring Road East. And we are setting up an institution uh, that is Standard Business Park because I've heard all the things that uh, have been said. I'm very happy that uh, we are not doing badly at all. We have done over 30 years of multi-party democracy, which we have put ourselves to. Ghana is a unique country, first to get independence. Unfortunately, there are certain things we didn't do. We are getting independence, and then the agreement 1884 agreement, we never saw it. Something happened and I went to British archives. And it is there. And a big brother of mine also went to Berlin, German archives. It is there. If you see what we are fighting independence for, you should know that we are on the road for ourselves to positively, positively develop our country as well as the African continent. Positively. If not all developments are positive, some are negative. Please, uh, Ghana, the most important thing is our cocoa shows that we are successful. Do you know, from 1958 to date, I haven't heard it from any of the party, uh, uh, speakers, 1958 to, to date, 30 to 60% of cocoa uh, uh, sold by Cote d'Ivoire is from Ghana. I went there myself when I was in school. We drove to the border and to a nice road. I was in Cape Coast University. And then when we went there, the driver would speak French and Ebe. And I, we saw people holding two twins. So I said, please ask them. Why, why are they in this place here? Only twins. The women started laughing, not knowing that's our cocoa bags at the back of the women. Yeah, no, please, I, I, I will not go beyond this. Just the cocoa. If, if IMF is coming here, and they haven't talked about Ghana cocoa, the smuggling is going on now, it goes on through Tama and uh, Takradi. Open uh, smuggling. So please, the most important thing, we don't need IMF facilities. I'm, I'm, I'm very positive. We in Ghana here, we will develop. Right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nicholas T from the Ghana National Association of Teachers. One, why is it that for almost any of the IMF programs that we go, the first one of the conditionalities will be job, uh, job cut or employ, seize unemployment, freeze unemployment. Why? That is one. Almost the first condition, or one of the conditions will be that there should be freeze unemployment. Why? Two. This one, you mentioned that there are conditionalities about the um, infrastructure development. There's going to be a cap or something on it. We go to our schools and we have a lot of challenges. Desks, classrooms, nothing. Now, what is going to be the, the correlation 
of the educational sector to the development of the country if this infrastructure are not uh, properly taken care of. Thank you very much. These are my two questions. Thank, Thank you me. very much. Uh, let's get uh, the panelists to address these questions and then uh, we'll come back and pick more questions. I'll start off with you, uh, Professor Bopping, and then I'll get to Tim because um, uh, you know, the question about uh, savings and everything and seeking advice, I'll get him to address that one. But first to you, Professor Bob Wing. All right, thank you. So um, I, I agree with you. Um, so I spoke about taxes at different levels in terms of the taxpayers. I spoke about corporate tax, and then I spoke about personal income tax. So when I spoke about the personal income tax, cumulatively, effectively, being more than 60%, I was looking at the 35% income tax bracket. I was looking at the VAT, which is more than 21% because it's paid by the final consumer that we are talking about here. And we're also talking about the same consumer spending those hours in traffic and buying fuel and the layers of taxes in that. So if you put the average middle income earner in Ghana, he's paying taxes almost in the same level as those in the Scandinavian countries. Okay, so typically, we will say that there will be nothing wrong with that if the state were to be efficient in the delivery of public services, right? And that is why, so we see things better if we look at them in relative terms. So for instance, Ghana's debt to GDP ratio could be more than 80%, but other countries have more than 100%, others have more than 200%, right? If you go to Japan and you see the level of infrastructure, if you look at US and the level of infrastructure and the rest of them, debt in itself, borrowing in itself is not a sin. That's what we teach. If we cancel that, I'll be successfully unemployed because I teach finance, I teach borrowing, I encourage people to borrow, okay? The point is that it could lead, after borrowing, you could end up with a good debt or a bad debt, okay? So let's ask Ghana, all the borrowing that we have done, has it resulted in a good debt or a bad word? Debt. I'll give you an example. When Ghana may be consistent with the way we won independence first, and we did our first zero bond in 2007, then that became the most competitive league in the world. It was not the premiership. It was not La Liga. It was how often African leaders were going to the euro bond market to borrow at coupon yields, sometimes more than 60% above the US Treasury yields, and we celebrated that. And even in Ghana, we've had our own version of Kenke and Wache Party, you understand that? That was more user-friendly. You know why? Because when we do those borrowing and the money arrives, the checks and balances are very low. Ghana signed a facility with China in more than $3 billion, right? After assessing a small percentage, a certain percentage of that, the incentive to go on perhaps wasn't as strong because of the monetary mechanism also. So you will see that the Chinese facility that was flagged, okay, there, there are underlying infrastructure. So let me ask you, and maybe we, we, let's ask ourselves, the euro bond market, our outstanding indebtedness is more than $14 billion. What do we have to show for it? Okay. Okay, so if the state were to be efficient in the delivery of public services, so if you say senior high school is free and you can get both the quantity in terms of access and then quality, and I'm paying a VAT of 21%, like what a lot of European countries are paying, is that okay? And corporate income uh, inter is, is high, personal income tax is high, and, and, and you can drink from the tap, and you don't have to pray before, during, and after, right? And all of that. Then you realize that, yeah, you are paying hard, but there is there's something in return. But that is not the case in Ghana. You look at the roads here. Okay. There are some places in this country, no matter how careful you are, you cannot miss the portholes. They are Prof. arranged in such a way that you, 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 you certainly get your portion. Prof, let's, let, let's have a question about why is it always that you know, government goes for these programs and there's a freeze on employment, yes. Yeah, so from independence, in fact, Ghana first approached the IMF for fund-supported program in 1965. 
under the watch of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Now, if you look at the template that we used in 1965, and the template we submitted in 2022, there's practically no variation. What were the causes? What were the challenges Dr. Kwame Nkrumah faced? Low reserves. And actually, our reserves had gone below the red line. In fact, our reserves in 1957 was $269 million. By the end of 1965, our reserves had gone down from positive $269 million to $391 million in deficit. And we could no longer fund our import. Okay, and Nkuma became popular because imported items became scarce. And our debt had ballooned to about $500 million by the end of 1965. In fact, inflation in 1964 was less than 1%. Inflation in 1964 in this country was 0.98%. Then we introduced our own CD in July 1965. By the end of 1965, inflation had gone up to 26.4% within that short time. The results, we went to the IMF. And the reason Nkrumah's name is not mentioned is because after the program was approved, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah rejected it. And it's simply because of the question you asked. The IMF prescription, which was cut this, cut that, cut that. And this was Nkrumah with the, his expansionary drive. And he felt that going along with the IMF program would be counterproductive, more or less, to the ambition that he had in the expanding infrastructure and the rest of them. But we can't tell how Nkrumah could have coped without the IMF because it wasn't long and his government was overthrown. And the first major economic decision Ghana took right after the overthrow of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was to go to the IMF. And since then, we have been regular, right? Now, come to why they ask this. It's not so difficult for the IMF to solve your problem, right? You look at what, what are the burdens? How do we reduce it? So you look at the low-hanging fruit. And sometimes, on the average, it is not really the IMF that is telling us that don't hire people. It's not the IMF. It's your own government. Remember, the government negotiated this program on our behalf. Then when they finished, they said that they will have regular dialogue. But we needed a dialogue before the program so that our views will be what? Reflected. Granted, that has been done. Okay. So we then decide that this is how we want to do the fiscal adjustment to reach the end game and the rest of that. And even if you look at the wage bill, you see, sometimes we need to look at it in relative terms. If you look at the proportion of our wage bill to total expenditure or to total revenue, it's not one of the highest in Africa. It's not one of the highest. We need to look at it carefully. As we speak right now, you check the data from Ghana Statistical Service. More than 80% of public sector workers in Ghana earn less than $300 a month. Okay, Prof, let's get to Tim, um, because you talked about how we should save, how we should adjust, but the question is, even if you ask, you ask us to go seek advice, we have to pay. Meanwhile, our salaries have remained the same, in some instances over the medium term, five years. So how do you cope? How do you thrive? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, it's, it's, a very difficult, uh, it's a very difficult question. You know, the challenges that um, the eloquent uh, speaker they asked about are being faced by everybody, right? All the households, everybody on the street is facing the same challenges. So I can assure you, say, it's not only you who are, who are feeling that, that pain. In, in fact, you know, one, one of the things that um, has been mentioned by the president recently was that you need a strong financial sector for the economy to grow. And it may not be that apparent, uh, but if one adds up the impairments that the financial sector took because of the DDEP, it adds up to more than 18 billion CDs. So the financial sector has bled more than 18 billion CDs. That's something like $1.6 billion that has just gone down the drain. Now, we need that same financial sector in order to fund the real economy. And it becomes a really difficult challenge for, for everybody to do that when this constant cycle of capitalization and erosion of capital keeps happening. So, so the challenge is across the economy. It's, it's in everyone's pockets and in everyone's business. The only point that we are making is, and not to belittle the extent of the, of the hardships that we're facing, the only point is 
when we are facing those hardships, it's important for us to see what we can do, right? What we can't do is to put our heads between our knees and cry. We, we need to do something, we need to act. So that's, that's really the point of, 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 my, of my contribution. Was just to say that there are things, small, small things that each of us can do during this difficult position. It doesn't mean that it becomes less difficult or that it belittles the extent of the difficulties that the economy is facing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, any other questions? Okay, I'll give a chance to those who haven't asked a question yet. So we'll pick the last two, here and there. I see two hands. So um, if after the two hands, there's still more time, we would get to you. Yes, but I see two hands. So, oh, is there a hand there? Okay, so I see three hands. Okay. <clears throat> and, and please, let's be brief with our questions. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Augustine Adongo, and I insist on being called Adongo. Because normally they call me Adongo. Adongo is the anglicized version of Adongo. The Englishman could, doesn't have O in his alphabet. So he changed the O in my original name to O. So please, it's Adongo, it's not Adongo. And Prof, thank you for saying we should declare war <clears throat> on the economy. But I think we should begin by declaring war on ourselves. All of us sitting here, if we are not middle class, we are upper class. And as Prof said, we watched and watched and watched as it drove us into the drain. But more importantly, it is our own behavior that allowed them to take us where we didn't want to go. I give you three points. One is on technology, the second one is on cocoa, and the third one is the informal sector. Let me start with cocoa. Let, let me start with cocoa. Do you know that 30% of cocoa farmers produce 70% of the cocoa output. 30% of cocoa farmers in Ghana produce 70% of the cocoa output. Now, many people see that as a problem, but as actually, as one of the panelists pointed out, a big opportunity, and that's where we come in. We've also learned lately that cocoa farmers are selling their lands to Galamseyes. Where do we come in? See, we had the money. Now we don't have it again because of the haircuts. We had the money. We could have invested in the cocoa sector as individuals. We could have taken up investment opportunities in the cocoa sector. And we could have employed people to start using drones, to start using modern technology to increase productivity in the cocoa sector. Just one point on that, and then the rest we can discuss prof afterwards. What I don't understand is why today we still have to use the cutlass to split the cocoa. Long ago, I used to work in the NGO sector, and they said, don't teach a man how to fish. Teach him, don't, don't give a man fish to eat. Teach him how to fish. In the private sector, we should be saying, that's not enough. If you teach a man how to fish, and that's what has been ha happening to Ghana, but he does not have the fishing net, what does he do? The important thing is the technology. That fishing net is the technology. So if we are doing cocoa, over the decades, over the years, we haven't developed technology to make cocoa more productive. That is the challenge between you and those of us in the private sector. There's investment opportunity there. It's not engineers, it's we in the private sector who should leverage that investment to grow the cocoa sector and to grow other sectors in Ghana. Thank I you very here. much.
let's get to yes the next person so this is more like a comment over there. okay there's a question there's a hand here thank you very much um damasus turuson is my name the president of the ghana national association of private schools i belong to a sector which is perhaps the most endangered out of the current economic crisis you run a system where uh, you have to compete with the public sector where uh, wages have been increased by some 30 percent and cola given to uh, workers and you have to do same in our situation many of much of our cost drives comes from payment of emol emoluments transportation feeding and these are precisely the areas where which have pushed up inflation. On the other hand, our revenues are crumbling because many parents cannot afford to pay our fees. At the beginning of this year, we proposed between 50 and 70 percent fee increments based on our calculations. There was a hue and cry which led to uh, an increment of between 20 and 50 percent in fees. This has reduced our revenues dramatically. Okay. Now, many of our members, small-scale uh, runners of the businesses, what can we do precisely in order to ramp up more revenue and in order to reduce our cost? But I also want to find out your take on free SHS. This is one area of expenditure which has probably assisted in sending us to the IMF. And when uh, the discussions were going on, many of us were expecting that they should tackle the area of free senior high, perhaps as a means of reducing expenditure. But that has not happened. So okay. what do you think about cutting on the expenditure on free SHS? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's, uh, yes. Thank you very much. I am Kwesi Krangsen. I'm all of private schools. Um, I think that we ought to look at looking at values, developing values in our future. Because this program is not going to end anytime soon. Our children, our grandchildren will be coming to face this situation. But what we realize is that tough decisions must be taken. And tough decisions depend on our value positions. Now, in our education system of more than reducing our strength, it's right. So I don't know what the panelists think about that. Perhaps education, we should focus more on value systems, teaching values, and building self-assertiveness in our children so that in future we can stand up for what is right. Okay. I don't know what you think about it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I will pick the last question. Hello, my name is Vishal Takwani, and I'm from B5+. Plus. So after hearing all of uh, the interesting things. I, I was thinking, you talked about the lean government, so I was curious how we set it up. And also, I, I, I've seen like there are some various acts and bills like the anti-corruption uh, legislation. Um, now, there are so many acts, but you still bring out like there are the problems. So what can we do? Because the number is like 3 billion, <laughs> like that is, a, that is significant. Now, what can we do? Like, what if I want to do something about it? Do I set up like a technology with like machine learning so like it can look at the procurement side so that they can compare values? Is there something we can do as a citizen? Great. Um, we need to. Okay, I think final final question there. Ah. Good morning. My name is Elom Go and um, from AgriSol. We are an agribusiness. Prof did mention um, of the fact that 
there are so many things of life that could be postponed. So you could uh, defer childbirth, for example, uh, marriage, uh, he said as well, when you build a house and so on and so forth. One thing he said that cannot be deferred is hunger. If you are hungry, you are hungry and you've got to eat almost immediately. Agriculture is confronted with so many challenges. The most threatening one is climate that we've so taken for granted that other dispensations have gotten ready towards in the last 20 years. Um, there's also the city and access to inputs and so on and so forth. I think that as a country, we are going nowhere until we start taking agriculture more seriously and um, support farmers or agriculture value chain players to defy all odds. And I'm happy Stambeck is here. Um, we cannot continue to overly scrutinize agriculture companies and put them in the risk box and say uh, agriculture is risky. And uh, so therefore, I mean, you, you go through special scrutiny if you have to assess a facility. And besides that, then the interest rate is also extremely high because then it's the same as, you know, a, a risky business. But here we are talking about not, uh, I mean, not being able to do without food. This should be something that concerns everyone. The development of food should be a worry. When we're going to bed, we should think of how, you know, Ghana's agriculture could progress. We are talking so much about cocoa. But the point is the efficiency, the productivity in the agriculture sector is so low because nobody is paying any special attention to it. So for me, we, we definitely need to, to spend more or to focus a little more on um, what matters the most, and which is food. It will change a lot of dynamics in this country. Thank you. Thank you much. And unfortunately, that's all time would allow us. Unfortunately, that's all time would allow us. Um, I promise I was going to get a lot of questions, but that's all time would allow us. So I'll get to Professor Bob Queen, who would address the questions briefly, and then we'll wrap it up. Is it possible to project my last slide? Maybe that would be the take home from here, if the technical team can do that. So I want to conclude with your position, and it's a way to go. We said this long ago. The reason Ghana's inflation is particularly high is also a reflection of the low investment and attention to agriculture, agribusiness, okay, value chain. And Ghana could actually transform from that end. In fact, if you look at the social accounting metrics, the income multiplier, the em employment multiplier effect of agricultural productivity is the highest. Okay, and then the inequality reducing effect of agriculture is the highest. So if you want to really start the transformation, then agriculture is very important. And, the, and, and, and I'll say this to businesses also. In fact, if you look at the African continental free trade, one of the few areas where Ghana can leverage is in the food value chain. And the market is huge. Africa spends approximately 44% of household expenditure on food. That is market. And Africa's net food import in 2015 was $35 billion. That is market. And this is projected to reach $110 billion by 2025. This is market. And we are moving beyond just agriculture and looking at agribusiness, agro-processing. And the job creation capacity or potential of that value chain is huge. And that is how we can solve Ghana's missing medal. Okay, and this is not a problem only in Ghana. Look, Africa has 65% of the world's unused arable land. And it's the same continent that spends on net food import $35 billion in, in, in 2015, and that is why when Russia and Ukraine started fighting, Africa had to send a, a delegation to Russia to stop so that we can feed our own people. We have all that it takes to feed our own people and the rest of the world. Look, Africa has the second largest 
and second longest rivers in the world. More than 44% of the tropical in the world, which is necessary for agriculture, are all in Africa. You can understand why the West can't let go on Africa. We are the only continent not sure what we are capable of doing with all that God has given us. If you look at the energy transition, lithium and the rest of them, we have it. Low, private, low fee private schools. Yes, so the point is that, yes, it may be easier to just say let's pass on the cost to the parents, but this is a crisis that spares no one, right? So it may be helpful to adopt a bit more of low cost and see how you can reduce costs and, and, and be able, it's better to have students in your school than to close down totally. We, there was a study that looked at the impact of COVID on low fee private schools and it was that massive. Right. But already, I want to say that Ghanaian businesses ha have survived the worst moment. If you look at the data from Ghana Statistical Service, when COVID came, the lockdown, the number of businesses that um, uh, um, closed down, those that came back, and those, those that never came back, didn't come back again, you will see that it's just a small percentage that actually died with COVID. Okay. So already there are some surviving coping strategies that we can build on. But to end this matter, are we on the slide? The last slide, or oh, if it's not it. No, this is not my slide. The last one. The last one is on Galamsey. Yeah, you saw it, right? If there's anything that causes me sleepless night, is Galamsey. What Galamsey is doing to Ghana. Look, what we call an economy in economics is not GDP. It's just a measure. An economy is an area under the effective economic control of a single government. So we cannot say that we have a government if we don't have a total control over the land area that Ghana claims to be our economy. If you look at the data in terms of the underground economy smuggling. If you check the total gold export from official records and you reconcile that with other countries that we export gold to, the difference is huge. So what that tells is that the gold, the diamond that we are taking from this illegal mining are not reported. We are losing the tax revenue on it and all of that. We cannot. And the, and look, Ghana is living less and less sustainably. If you are in the middle class, this message is to you that you are more at risk than the guy who is begging on the street, right? Because we are undermining the ecosystem that supports life in the rural areas. And if they are not safe, you are not safe at cantonment. You are not safe at East Legon. Let's all of us come on board. Well, let's not wait till the worst moment happens. And I'm, that's not what I'm wishing for Ghana. But the data is very clear that we are heading dangerously. And we need to take another look and make a turn for the good. I remember in the book of Acts, chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and Apostle Paul, who had never been to school, and he preached, and the people heard the word, they asked, what shall we do? What do you want to do this morning with what you have heard? The response is more important. There will be no offertory. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Godfrey Bocking. And thank you very much, Timo Goody. Uh, thank you also, Benjamin Boache. Um, before we have the chairman's closing remarks, uh, there are questionnaires on your tables. Kindly take a few seconds to respond to those questions. And also the Ghana Yearbook. Now, that's the one book all of you should own. Uh, one thing uh, that uh, still does is bring the scattered information in one handy piece. And the Ghana Yearbook has everything that you want to know about Ghana uh, this year. So get one before you leave. That is also very, very important. At this point in time, I know we've had very great discussions and all of, all of us have learned lessons. We'd invite the chairman to give us his closing remarks as we welcome him with a round of applause. Mark Bidwabwaji, who is CEO of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Thank you very much. Uh
passé. Hello. Who have one key performance indicator for whoever is the president of this country? And that should be not to take us to IMF. It's not the speed to which we are able to get um, a deal from IMF. It's the fact that they are not taking to IMF. And I think that is very important. For Ben, I think you yourself you are struggling to cope, but you might test on to cope. Team, but I was wondering how operational or achievable are some of the things you're asking us to do to cope. Agree. I don't think you'll be thinking about say, what you'll be thinking about. Is you. But I'm always standing. There are good points that you all have to me. In trying to stabilize me that the private sector is the engine of growth. IMF is not panacea to our It will come to stabilize, create the environment. We need the private sector to take up or take advantage of this environment that will be created to create the job, expand, and also create employment for us. So we should not sacrifice the private sector for any IMF conditionalities. One other important which as Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, we have said several times on other platforms. But I think this platform is bigger. And the managers of the economy are listening to us. Is that we cannot tax ourselves out of this problem. There are a lot of taxes and businesses are dying. They are collapsing. And they are relocating into the neighboring countries. It is real. Businesses are moving out. If you survive and grow our economy, let us put in place mitigation measures to ensure that we bring relief to the private sector. I'm making a humble appeal to the managers of the economy that we have a media budget ahead of us. And of course, for the first time, we are going to have comprehensive budget review. Policies may change, and I expect that the government will put in place measures to bring relief to businesses, bring relief to citizens, and bring relief to all of us, because we are all hot suffering. Thank you very much. Thank you to Winston for your good work. Uh, adding to your options, knowing that quality and standard remains intact and our content, which is accepted as truth and accuracy every day, is accessible on the go. Access your favorite daily graphic and our weeklies, The Mirror, Graphic Business, Graphic Showbiz, Junior Graphic, and Graphic Sports on Graphic News Plus app. It's the digital replicas of our work. Download Graphic News Plus app on the Google Play Store, Apple App Store, and available on www.graphicnewsplus.com as you remain abreast of and keep pace with on the minute news updates on the go. Home sweet home. Welcome family and friends. Choose the bundle that best works for you from as low as 10 Ghana cities weekly for unlimited access to all publications. Graphic. Truth and accuracy every day. For more news, please visit our website graphic.com.gh or follow us on Facebook at Daily Graphic and on YouTube and Twitter at GraphicGH. 
Subscribe now.